The uh, subcommittees will come to order, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the two-year-old Syrian civil war has produced increasingly horrific human rights violations, including summary executions, torture, and rape. Most recently, both government and rebel forces have targeted medical and humanitarian aid personnel. Snipers, and I read this and I, I was sickened by it, are reportedly targeting pregnant women and children and actually passing around cigarettes when they kill uh, an unborn child who was put into their sights. Since the civilian civil war began, more than 100,000 people have been killed and nearly 7 million people have been forced to leave their homes. By December of this year, it is estimated that neighboring countries such as Turkey, Lebanon, and Iraq could see as many as 3.5 million Syrian refugees. Those who have perpetrated human rights violations among the Syrian government, the rebels and the foreign fighters on both sides of this conflict, must be shown that their actions will have serious consequences. H. Conrad's 51, introduced on September 9th, calls for the creation of an international tribunal that would be more flexible and more efficient than the International Criminal Court to ensure accountability for human rights violations committed by all sides and by more people. This hearing will examine the diplomatic, political, and legal and logistical issues necessary for the establishment of such a court. Today's hearing will examine controversial issues such as sovereignty, the ICC versus ad hoc regional tribunals, and the sponsorship of such a tribunal. Perhaps the most famous war crimes tribunals were the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials, the post-World War II trials of Axis military officers and government functionaries responsible for almost unimaginable crimes against humanity. The Cold War rivalry between the U.S. and the former Soviet Union prevented the international cooperation necessary for war crimes tribunals to be convened by the U.N. After the end of the international political conflict, there have been three particularly notable international tribunals to hold accountable those guilty of genocide or crimes against humanity in the former Yugoslavia, in Rwanda, and in Sierra Leone. Each of these tribunals have achieved a level of success that has escaped the International Criminal Court. The Yugoslavia Tribunal, for example, has won 69 convictions, the Rwanda Tribunal, 47, and the Sierra Leone Tribunal has won 16 convictions. Meanwhile, the ICC, costing about $140 million annually, has thus far seen only one conviction. The ICC process is distant and has no local ownership of its justice process. It is less flexible than an ad hoc tribunal, which can be designed to fit the situation. The ICC re requires a referral. In the case of the President and Deputy President of Kenya, it was Kenya itself that facilitated the referral. This is highly unlikely in the case of Syria. Russia and the UN Security Council would likely oppose any referral of the Syrian mantle to the, to the ICC but might be convinced to support an ad hoc proceeding that focuses on war crimes by the government and by the rebels, one that allows the plea bargaining for witnesses and other legal negotiations to enable such a court to successfully punish at least some of the direct perpetrators of increasingly horrific crimes. And Syria, like the United States, never ratified the Rome Statute that created the ICC, which does raise legitimate concerns about sovereignty with implica implications for our country with this panel, uh, which will also be addressed today. There are issues that must be addressed for any Syria war crimes tribunal to be created and to operate successfully. There must be sustained international will for it to happen in a meaningful way. An agreed-upon system of law must be the basis for proceedings. I remember when we were discussing the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, sitting right here in this room, not only did I convene hearings on it, I actually passed a resolution that was passed on the Senate side by Alphonse D'Amato, I did it on the House side, because we were so concerned that important information was not being transferred uh, to the Chief Prosecutor to allow a successful indictment and prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic and others. I remember also there was concerns about, uh, there was a people concern, the number of very, very interested parties, that it was designed to fail because it was so grossly underfunded, particularly uh, at its onset, so that the, the, the kind of work that needed to be done was not being done. 
An agreed upon structure, a funding mechanism, and a location for the proceedings must also be found. There must be a determination on which and how many targets of justice will be pursued. A timetable and time span of such a tribunal must be devised as well. And there are even more issues that must be settled. Um, David Crane, uh, one of today's witnesses, has suggested five potential mechanisms for a Syrian war crimes tribunal. One, an ad hoc court created by the UN. Second, a regional court authorized by treaty uh, with a regional body. An internationalized domestic court, a domestic court comprised by Syrian nationals within a Syrian justice system. And of course, the fifth would be the ICC itself. Each of these first four models have some benefits, some more than others. The ICC can be ruled out, and a domestic court in the near future seems highly unlikely. However, we are not here today to decide which of these models will be chosen. Rather, our objective in this hearing is to promote the concept of a Syrian war crimes tribunal, whatever form it eventually takes. Again, those who are now even perpetuating crimes against humanity must be told that their crimes will not continue with impunity. Syria has been called the world's worst humanitarian crisis. According to the World Health Organization, an epidemic of polio has broken out uh, in northern Syria because of declining vaccination rates. One might reasonably also consider it the worst human rights crisis in the world today. Therefore, the international community owes it to the people of Syria and their neighbors to do all that we can to bring a halt to these actions while creating uh, a, an accountability uh, effort. We have assembled a highly distinguished panel to discuss the pros and cons of creating and sustaining a Syrian war crimes tribunal. This is not an academic exercise. We must understand the difficulties of making accountability for war crimes in Syria a reality, and we must do it now. Therefore, we must understand the challenges involved so that we can meet and overcome them and give hope to the terrorized people of Syria. Their suffering must end, and the beginning of that end could come through the results of today's proceedings. I would like to yield to my friend and colleague, Ms. Bass, uh, for any opening comments.